Welcome everybody. We'll just wait maybe one more minute as uh, more folks get added. I know uh, the clock has struck four, but I see the, um, the wait room adding uh, to the number of attendees. So we'll just wait maybe uh, one more minute. Jason, the clock struck four on the West Coast. That's true. I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, four o'clock here in, uh, in California. We are uh, well represented uh, geographically on this call. So yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, good afternoon from California, but good evening uh, in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and New York. Well, let's get started in the interest of time. And uh, I see more folks are joining us. We have uh, some hundred plus uh, registr registr registration uh, <laughs> registrations for the uh, panel today. I want to um, welcome everybody to this, uh, what I suspect will be a fascinating and important and interesting discussion uh, titled Covering Protests, New Challenges for a New Era. And we're really um, looking to talk today about how reporters and photographers and editors should weigh their responsibility to report on public matters uh, when it comes to covering protest, balanced against the ethical concerns such as privacy and safety of their subjects. Um, we're really gonna be talking about sometimes the balance and uh, conflict maybe between the, the legal rights and ethical responsibilities of, of journalists and others and uh, the rights of protesters, journalists, and citizens, the ethics around covering protests, and the importance uh, about building trust between communicators and, and communities. So I want to um, introduce and welcome our three distinguished panelists. I can't think of a more qualified group of um, scholars and teachers to, to lead us through this discussion today. Um, first, I would like to, to uh, introduce Danielle Kilgo. Danielle Kilgo is the John and Elizabeth Bates Cowles Professor of Journalism, Diversity and Equality, at the University of Minnesota. She reaches, uh, researches uh, representations of marginalized communities, meeting fra uh, media framing of protests and media effects. Um, second, joining us today is uh, Kathleen Bartson Culver, Katie Culver, uh, as, uh, the, is the uh, James E. Burgess Chair in Journalism Ethics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where she focuses on free expression rights and responsibilities, uh, including especially in campus contexts and journalism. And third, Stephen Solomon is joining us. Stephen uh, is the founding editor of First Amendment Watch and teaches First Amendment law at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University. He's most recently the author of Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founding Generation Created the Freedom of Speech. So welcome and thank you all for uh, making the time today. Um, let's, let's start by maybe, Danny, if I can ask you to start off by um, helping us put the protests that we've seen in the last year into some some context. You know, what are we, what are we trying to talk about today, and how should we think about framing some of these issues? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and the last year is sort of relative because 2020 was 9,000 years, and 2021 <laughs> is starting off at 8,000 years, and we're just in February. <laughs> But uh, what I think um, is really important just framing this conversation is differentiate, differentiating between the protests that we saw this summer um, and the differences between the protests and, and the violence and the riots um, 
there. And then the and the and the the gathering that we saw at the Capitol, um, which might have at surface level have begun um, as a protest or a rally to quote. Save America, end quote, but um, that evolved into so much more than that um, because there was violence, because there was, you know, people literally trying to take over the Capitol. And so what we saw this summer is not comparable. <laughs> um, and we, what we, uh, in, in terms of what it is, in terms of what these mass gatherings are, um, there's a lot of coverage about there being a double standard in terms of how police treated these groups. And that, that remains true. And there's a lot of coverage about how the media treated these two groups differently. And that remains true. Um, but still these groups are, are apples and oranges. Um, so to speak, uh, what we saw at the Capitol was a group of very privileged individuals gathered around an empowered person in charge, right? Um, and this was an attempted insurrection. This was a an attempt at a coup d'etat. But what we saw this summer and in Wisconsin and in and, and Rochester last night, right? Um, uh, these were many of these protests, right? And there, there's lots of different groups and different actors. They're not led by one specific president. Um, there's, this is a mass gathering of people um, and a grassroots effort to sort of protest injustice. And, um, you know, there's a lot of entities that go into that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that today, but it's, and it's important to dissect who does what and, and what, what, who engages in particular activities. Um, but for the most part, it's really important to just know that like what, what we saw this summer in, in Minneapolis and beyond, these are protests and sometimes, sometimes they do get out of hand and sometimes there are other actors that instigate violence, uh, whether it's the police or, or um, uh, other you know, entities that are trying to discredit protesters. Um, but uh, that's not the same as what we uh, saw in the Capitol. Um, but I, uh, I think just basically it's a long winded way of saying that uh, the Capitol riot is really um, not the orange that we're talking about today, uh, because it's not a protest and that's kind of the takeaway of that. So I, I want to start by talking about some legal issues, but I want to see if, if Katie or Steve you want to add anything about sort of the framing of the context of our discussion and and um, what we're talking about when we, we maybe use the word protest and that maybe is covering different things to different people. Well, I would just echo and amplify what Danny was saying in that, um, you know, precision is so important. There is a difference between a protest and a riot. There's a difference between a protest and an insurrection. There's a difference between protesting power and sub trying to subvert a free and fair election. And so I think whenever we talk about rights and responsibilities, we have to be precise in exactly what we're discussing. Yeah, and I also think that, you know, throughout American history, you look at protest movements, there have always been fringe elements who broke the law. The 99% of the people are protesting uh, nonviolently, they're serious about what they're doing. So the frame issues around the few who are breaking the law, I think is the wrong way to go. Well, Steve, let's jump into some of the, um, the legal issues first, but before we talk about uh, some broader issues, wh what should journalists know about the basics of covering a public protest? What, what can they do? What can't they do? What are some of the, the legal parameters journalists should uh, be aware of? Sure. Well, I, I think it's important to say that these traditions go back a very long way. Um, I think one of the first protests in America was in 1765 around a Liberty Tree in Boston, protesting against the Stamp Act. People were out there protesting, um, putting their views out there and, and protest is, is, is part of democracy. Um, in the First Amendment, you have uh, the right to, to speak, the, the right to uh, of a free press, but if you can't organize and get out in the streets and demonstrate, and demand the redress of grievances, then you really don't have a democracy. And so the right to protest, the right to assemble in the streets, on the sidewalks, in the parks, that's public space, it's called a public forum. Um, that, is, that is absolutely critical uh, to democracy. So, so journalists and really anybody who wants to join in, in a protest has a first amendment right to be there, to protest. Um, this is a public forum, traditionally, as I said, going back uh, even before the country was, was uh, founded. 
Um, this is what people did. And the courts recognize that protest is essential to, the, to democracy. Having said that, it's important to note for protesters and for journalists alike, um, the right to protest is not absolute. And um, the government can regulate based on legitimate time, place, and manner regulations. So for example, some jurisdictions may, re may require uh, people to get a, a parade permit, and they may be able to uh, uh, specify the time of the protest or where it takes place, uh, things like that. If it's a legitimate nonpartisan um, kind of regulation, when I say nonpartisan, I mean one of the key elements of the First Amendment is the government is not allowed to discriminate on the basis of viewpoints. So they can't say you can protest on this issue, but you can't protest about that. Or we accept one viewpoint, but not another. It's, it's open to everyone and, and, and th that discrimination can't take place. Um, the government can uh, put curfews on demonstrations if there's disorder. Uh, the curfews can specify when an event has to end and uh, there can be dispersal orders um, and, and, and things like that. Um, the, the protesters um, and the journalists basically have the same rights out there. They're, 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 they're co-equal. And um, um, if, the, if, the, if the police uh, have a curfew that they're, um, they're enforcing, the journalists have to leave as well unless they have permission to stay. And the permission can come from a, maybe a press pass or arrangements in advance that the police look for identifications or, or journalists say that they're um, uh, covering something and the police should, they, they really should recognize uh, the First Amendment rights of, of, of the, the media to, to, cover, um, to cover these events. Now, it's also important to note that reporters are out there, they're taking notes, they have maybe cell phones uh, and making images. The police um, do not have the right to take someone's cell phone uh, without a warrant. Um, that may happen from time to time, and sometimes those, they end up in cases uh, before judges. But uh, the police, if they ask for your cell phone, you can say no. If you let them take a look at it, then you are probably um, giving up your your rights. So th thanks, Steve. That's a very comprehensive look at some of the the legal issues. For the audience, I failed to mention at the beginning, uh, I encourage you to put questions in the Q&A function. I will try to save uh, as much time as we need for uh, your questions at the end. So please feel free to put those into the Q&A function as we uh, continue the conversation. And I'll, I'll uh, be monitoring those as the discussion goes on and, and try to come to as many as possible. So uh, maybe can I uh, turn next to Katie? Um, Katie, are there things that you want to emphasize that Stephen mentioned or um, maybe underscore, um, you know, are, are there any kind of special rights that journalists have when covering protests? Uh, and is there any difference between credentialed journalists and, you know, what we sometimes call citizen journalists or um, uh, people who are reporting from social media feeds? Uh, about protests. I, I want to follow up on one thing um, Stephen mentioned, which was, which is that um, the idea that there can be no viewpoint discrimination, which is, which is true and beautiful in theory, but super complicated and disappointing in practice. <laughs> so you know, it, you see uh, from the you know um, chemical, I won't say tear gas, but the chemical clearing of Lafayette Square for a photo op. Uh, I would argue is clearly viewpoint discrimination. Had the president agreed with what uh, with what protesters were saying, none of that would have happened. So while it's true that that is the ideal to which we are supposed to adhere, uh, we routine, routinely do not adhere to it. Uh, I, I, for one, was astonished to see people being dispersed uh, from the Capitol riot 
uh, in anything other than handcuffs, which which they clearly were not uh, cuffed going forward. So I think I, I think it's important to say that that. The, that is our standard, but we don't often live up to that standard. Um, I also would say it's completely true that um, journalists do not enjoy a coverage right beyond that of the of the public. So a, a journalist, in the eyes of the of the law, is just like a citizen, <laughs> um, and 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 I think there are really good aspects to that because it it doesn't confer some special right. Um, on journalists, which then would force us to try to des decide who is and who is not a journalist. But I, I, I'm a huge fan of the political philosopher Isaiah Berlin, who points to positive and negative conceptions of liberty. And um, you know, what are the things that he focuses on? So a negative conception of liberty is, is freedom from government interference. So I am free from the government telling me what I can and cannot say. But positive liberty is freedom too. And I think in some very important and consequential cases, you have seen government um, embrace that positive conception. So for instance, after the, the night of the insurrection on January, on the, the evening of January 6th, um, you saw the Washington DC police say that anyone who had a, a, a journalistic credential would not be subject to the curfew. So, so journalists could continue to be out reporting. So that is a, a government positive embrace of journalistic coverage of a critically important moment in our history. And so we spend a lot of time saying what government cannot do. I'd love to see us uh, say more about what, what government can and should do to encourage citizens to peaceably assemble, to protest, to, to get redress of their grievances. I have two questions, two more questions about sort of a couple of legal specifics. And if you can keep the answers brief, that'd be, be helpful. Um, you know, one question that often comes up is what should either a journalist or a citizen do if uh, they're told by the police to stop recording or if police want to confiscate their phone? What should people do in the, in the moment? Conceptually, it's easy to say we have a First Amendment right if we're in a public place to record but what should people do if they're told to stop or asked to, to turn over their phones? Uh, well, I think you have to uh, make the point very clearly to the police officer that there is a First Amendment right and you will seek legal counsel um, to effectuate that right. Now, in, in the short term, you have a tough decision to make, right? Because if you continue recording uh, in the face of a police order, um, you're, going, you're probably going to be arrested. And in that case, uh, you want to, um, you know, get a lawyer as quickly as possible because, you know, if you, if you do have a First Amendment right to record, and if you haven't been interfering with the police, you haven't gotten in a way, you haven't, you know, uh, caused any safety problems, then you're, you're quite likely to win the case. So it, it's worthwhile to litigate. There was a uh, very recently, uh, Denver had to pay um, a, a, a journalist $50,000 to settle a case in which uh, she was recording um, on a sidewalk. Uh, she was out of the way. She, uh, she, the, the police demanded that she stop. She refused, and they put her in handcuffs. So you have to be prepared for that. Um, that's, that's a tough decision to make, um, to stand up for your rights. Um, but uh, she did in that case, and a lot of people have. And that's why we, we have cases in court on these, on these issues. My last legal question before we turn to some ethical questions. In the last year, uh, we've seen several states uh, introduce or consider laws to increase penalties for various protest-related infractions. What is motivating these laws in state legislatures, and what are what are some implications of some of these bills? And Steve, maybe I'll go to you for, for a, a beginning point. Sure. Well, a lot of these laws have, have come you know, very recently in the, in the last couple of years. And I think they're motivated by um, the legislators um, uh, seeing the violence in, in some of these demonstrations. And, you know, consistent with what I was saying before, they may, it might be violence uh, perpetrated by only a, a few people, but they, they target those people and they, um, they pass laws which uh, do essentially do two things. 
One is they've increased the penalties for violations. So for example, um, uh, there's, there's, there was one state that um, was punishing uh, the blocking of traffic. Now that was uh, previously uh, a $150 fine with no jail sentence, no jail term. They increased it to $10,000 and three years in jail. So they're taking uh, relatively minor offenses that are classified as misdemeanors and they're upping it to felonies which involve high fines, jail sentences, and so forth. Um, another thing that they're, that they're doing is they are creating new crimes. So for example, um, there have been uh, jurisdictions that um, have um, put in um, you know, punishments for uh, organizations that uh, promote um, demonstrations that end up in violence. Now, what does promote mean? It can mean that you you write a check for, for some group. It could mean that you promoted the demonstration on social media. Hey, you know, come at three o'clock for, for a, a, a demonstration on the street. It doesn't mean you actually participated in doing anything wrong. What, what these laws do essentially is they chill speech. You know, if, you, if the penalties are high and the laws are vague and the laws are overbroad, as I've described, then there's a, gonna be a lot of people who, who say, eh, I don't know if I wanna get involved in that. Um, I don't really trust law enforcement to you know, in, enforce laws equally. Um, or, and, 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 and so I'm gonna get into trouble. And so I think that, that is the, probably the biggest single danger. Um, you don't wanna chill speech in a democracy. I'd actually, I'd actually point to an even bigger danger, and I want to invite Danny to, um, you know, because her research is so much more in depth in this area than I am. But to me, um, I, I see some of these measures as purposely design, designed for disenfranchisement, because they're elevating minor offenses into felonies, which in many jurisdictions means losing the right to vote. Uh, Danny, do you, does that, does that? I mean, it's more. It goes beyond chilling speech. <laughs> Right. I mean, I think that part of this, people are going to continue to protest on a massive scale every single time a particular incident happens and we're not going to instill institutional change in something like our policing. Right. I think I think the government's responses to that. No, we're not going to change, but we are going to stop you and, and we will stop you at multiple levels. Right. And I think that the consequence of being incarcerated, which, you know, higher fines, we already know this. This is what started some of these Black Lives Matter protests is the inability to pay higher fines, right? And to have arrest records and to be in these situations on a regular basis. These are some of the situations that our poor communities face. And these are more likely the people that are out there on the streets trying to get justice, right? And so I think it is, it's just this, um, this building block of, of being able to disenfranchise people who are protesting, especially civil rights rights causes. We don't see this happen for other kinds of protests on a regular basis, whether they have merited, uh, you know, gotten more or gotten, um, uh, you know, permission to have their protest or not. We don't see this kind of crackdown on things like the Women's March or the gun control marches or um, even anti-Trump marches. And so um, I think I think it's important to know that, the, that these, these um, uh, the, just utilizing these, um, when, when these are actually enforced, I should say, um, will we, we'll always, there will always be a color line there. Um, and there will always be some of the marginalization that we see with all other laws that will happen with the communities that are um, engaged in protest. I'd, I'd like to shift gears now to talk a little about some of the ethical issues that uh, have come up. Uh, journalists can experience resistance from law enforcement and legal issues as we've been talking about, but, but resistance can also come from the communities that they're covering and cover the protests that they're covering. Um, Katie and Danny, could you maybe talk a little about um, maybe some examples of this in, in, in what ways have protesters resisted or challenged uh, news coverage? Danny, do you want to lead off and I'll back clean up? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I mean, I think a lot of protesters, they, um, I, I, there's a lot of, there's a lack of trust to some degree. There's a, a very long history of the media marginalizing 
um, specific protests and also delegitimizing and demonizing other protests. And, and so there's a lack of trust that's um, deserved <laughs> to some degree. Uh, and um, I, I, I worked with a bunch of activists in BC and I know some of the journalists there were, were concerned about being blocked out of protests, not being able to con get in contact with leaders. Um, and they were avoiding them. They were, they were refusing to talk to them. Um, even at one protest, they were assigning journalists that they trusted bracelets um, so that they would know their, their community of, of, of uh, advocates would know who to go to or who to speak to and who not to. And I think that's, that's sort of a consequence of both um, having journalists from all kinds of different um, outlets and content creators and, um, and that mistrust with the, the traditional sort of ethically bound um, journalism community. So, um, so that's, that's one of the things that I, I saw and I think there's a lot of ways to challenge that, but Katie, I'll let you jump in here if you, if you wanna talk about something else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would extend it into, um, I'm doing some research along with Jason in, in campus contexts. And one of the things that I really encourage um, reporters, whether they're freelance or, or associated with a specific news outlet, to think about is the why behind that lack of trust. So go back to the um, protests over racial inequity at the University of Missouri and a huge conflagration over um, a photojournalist not being allowed into a space that, that some had defined as a safe space. And all of this, you know, just, it was just a hue and cry about well, they have a first amendment right to be there. It's a public space, you know, um, yeah. Okay, great, but we can all agree. Yes, you, if they are on a public street or in a public park, yes, you have the right to go in and take a photo. Um, but what I heard a lot from journalists was like, well, we have a right to be there. That, yes, that is different from why does this group of people have such a fundamental level of distrust and what are you going to do to change that? Um, to tie it to some of what happened last summer and a, and a question I just saw come in from Natalie Yar. Um, so I'll sort of answer it live rather than waiting for the Q&A portion <laughs> um, is, you know, there, a lot of protesters were very concerned about how things were being framed in news media and a lot of excessive attention to violence um, rather than coverage of the issues that were giving rise to the protests to begin with. So talking about um, looting or the incidences of, of arson, and I'm not trying to minimize those, but, but speaking about those as violence, but not speaking about what gave birth to the protests, which was violence by police against black and brown people. And so again, I go back to what I said earlier about precision. To me, one of the ways that we work to build trust is being very precise in our coverage, not focusing so much on conflict, not focusing so much on events, but instead giving voice to the real and valid issues that gave rise to these protests. So let's let's talk maybe just one more question about sort of the the conflicts and issues before we we maybe turn to some of the solutions, some of the suggestions that journalists can do, um, you know, do better. Um, Danny, can you talk maybe a little more about either drawing from some of your research uh, about these um, both the sort of longer history of um, of why protesters sometimes are uh, either resistance, not the right word, resistant to news coverage, but skeptical or suspicious of um, journalists sort of sometimes parachuting into communities. Um, what have you found in your research and, and why do you, what do you hear and see as some of those causes? Sure, I think pre-digital pre era, there was always like a legacy of the mainstream media focusing on that violence and the actions of protests rather than giving the substance sort of the space that it needed to get the, the protesters grievances, the reason why they're out there across to the news audiences. And, and that, that negative pattern um, was really situated in, in protests like about about war. I mean, it it touched on all kinds of different protests. It wasn't at this point just anti-racism protests, but but uh, you know, there's lots of different um, uh, protests that have been delegitimized by the police. So, like advocates may have this, um, especially uh, people who advocated in other eras, right? They may have this um, very well earned uh, sort of um, caution about media coverage. Um, 
about progressive issues. And that's generally things that push against the status quo. But my, my research shows that just in modern day, one of the protests that is most delegitimized, that is, is most susceptible, susceptible to, to this violent coverage and sort of not having the, the grievances and demands in, in the coverage in, instead um, are Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and that that sort of is is the crux of how the mainstream media um, helps sort of um, just reinforce what the government wants and needs, right? They need stability and they need things to be peaceful. And they would really like for you to just wait until the trial's over and quietly be upset in your homes. And um, they, the media likes to cover the actions when protesters cannot can no longer stay in their homes, when advocates can no longer stay in their homes um, and grieve alone, right? They they mass they make this mass effort to to get attention and to say this can happen no more, and it takes that mass effort to ever get coverage in the first place. Right, but I think as as protests have incre have increased around the world, like everybody has had to up what they've done and how big their protest is and and how big their actions are, so that they continue to get that coverage. Um, but you know, the the catch twenty two there is that protesters are that the the mainstream the, the the media coverage really focuses way more on their actions than it ever does on their substance. In the end people continue to die, right? In the end, we continue to see the same court proceedings happen over and over and over, the same impunity with government officials and not having their voice in coverage, not having um, their actions portrayed accurately or, or holistically even. Um, it, that, that sort of leads to this this distrust or mistrust um, of those communities. There's also, you know, tons of other avenues in which they can try to get a message out, and they do now, um, whether it's through their own social media channels or through, you know, more traditional activist and alternative media. And I think that that's something to to juggle with and think about too. Katie, if, I think if I, could, if I add one, one thing, yeah, I, I think these alternative channels are really important and, and more so all the time. Um, what we're also facing is a, a, the decimation of local news and, and reporters. I mean, if you look city after city, um, you know, down from a generation ago, there might have been two or three or four newspapers in, 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 in a city, and now there's maybe one. There's some cities with no newspapers, and there are just fewer reporters, and there's fewer people that dig in. And I think this is also part of the problem. Um, so. So these alternative channels, I think, are are really increasingly important now um, to to get the word out and to um, really delve into some of these issues that are simply not um, explored by the media. What's left of it? Well, yeah, I think that ties, that ties back, Jason, to you know something you said earlier about you know do you give up your camera? That's not just a question for journalists. It's also a question for people who are witnessing. And part of what we are seeing, part of this reckoning is, arises from that witnessing. And um, you know, my advice to people is when, when told to surrender your camera or your phone, record that demand. <laughs> you know, that, that is part of witnessing as well. We really, we would not, I won't, I won't, I won't speak in we, I won't speak for anyone else. I would not have understood George Floyd's killing in the way I understand it, had there not been that witnessing. And, uh, and, and I think journalists should pay attention uh, to what that story might have looked like had there not been that witnessing. So it would have looked like a police report that was highly sanitized. It would have looked like an, an, an official investigation um, within a system of laws that favors police. Um, and so that ought to wake all of us up. Ethically, um, to, get back to, to get back to your question, the, the question of the moment, um, you know, ethically, I think there's some very important things to consider. So one, I would point to um, a really excellent piece um, put out by, again, Natalie Yar. Well, you're getting a lot of shout outs, Natalie. Um, you could go to the Center for Journalism Ethics website and, and look for it. It's a guide to less extractive reporting. Uh, with the idea that sometimes reporting can be like strip mining. We come into a community, we take what we need for stories like they are natural resources, and we leave without much thought for the landscape that we've left behind. And that, you know, 
some journalism is is rightfully accused of being extractive, but that doesn't mean it has to be. We can we can look at other ways to do this, ways to to you know engage with communities over the long term, to be issues and trends focused rather than events focused. I, I think that's a really important consideration. I'd also point to um, the work of another scholar, in, in addition to Danny's important work, um, Anita Varma at the Markula Center. Um, for applied ethics, I think I have that right, um, has done some really interesting work on solidarity as a concept in journalism. So we, I would argue we have gotten better at empathy, um, but that's different. Empathy operates at an individual or small group level, whereas thinking of ourselves as in solidarity with marginalized groups operates at a more socio-political level. And I, and I think that's something that journalism ought to be reclaiming. Yeah, I just like to add, um, picking up on something that Katie said about about recording, um, the these these cases that have gotten to court um, have all been decided the same way. So half of the U.S. Uh, courts of appeals, uh, as of now, have um, declared a First Amendment right to record, and that that's that's without question. It hasn't gotten to the Supreme Court yet, but. It's interesting if when you read these opinions, they, they all basically say the same thing, which is that that it this is a core First Amendment right, the right to record police officers, because it helps people, it helps the people uncover abuses and then do something about it. And that's the essence of the First Amendment, which is oversight by the people of public officials, including law enforcement, um, and making it's, it, it possible for these abuses to be seen, to be disseminated so everybody sees them, and that we can do something about it. And that's, that's why I think we have these movements now like Black Lives Matter, because we have the documentation in front of us, and you can't deny what you see um, on the video. It's just, it's there. Another ethical issue that has come up uh, in, in multiple settings is um, the, the requests or sometimes demand by protesters to journalists not to um, broadcast their, their face or likelihood or name for fear of potential retribution. You know, I think that kind of um, uh, illustrates some tension between sort of traditional journalist views of, you know, we have this right to report on things that are happening in public, public, public places, but a need to reconsider perhaps in some circumstances, the ethical responsibilities given the potential harms that can come from that reporting. Um, you know, Danny, could I maybe go to you first? What are your thoughts on what journalists should or shouldn't do in terms of those kinds of requests or demands? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think there's different scenarios in which you might get asked that question, right? But um, for the most part, um, and those that I've that I've talked to that have asked journalists not to not to show their face in pictures when they're doing stuff are not engaged in criminal activity. They're afraid of government surveillance, right? They're afraid of being tracked, much like the 1960s protester activists were. They're afraid of being tracked and, and tracked down. I mean, there's a lot of unsolved mysteries, so to speak, of activists from Ferguson that you, that I mean, just these horrendous stories about how their families have died, how they have died, that just aren't, they don't have all the pieces to put together, right? Um, and it, it may be a conspiracy, but even then, <laughs> it still feels like a real threat because it's been a real threat for people who have been protesting racial injustice for a really long time. And I don't think you can um, uh, sort of deny that, right? And so I, so I think that it, considering why, why, why are they asking for this is, is super important because for, for the most part, I think that they, they may not want their boss to know, they may get fired, right? Um, they may end up um, having, having, like I said, like being surveilled by their local, their local government. If it's not in a big city, this is, this is a lot bigger of an issue in a rural city, right? Where people, everybody knows everybody. And so um, I think you really have to think about why. If they are breaking into a building and they just don't want you to show their face, I think that you have one set of ethical boundaries in which you can decide you are going to 
not publish that story or not. I would venture to say that that violence of someone looting one store is probably not what the protest is about and the photo would be inappropriate anyway. But um, if they're asking not to have their face shown and they were on a megaphone for a little while and they feel like they're in a particular situation where they may be you know, threatened, um, I think that, that a different set of ethical guidelines should be applied. Katie, do you want to um, add anything to uh, you? I see you've been sharing great resources in the in the chat. You know, um, sort of we're coming to the conclusion of my questions, and then I want to get to the audience. Two questions left: one for you, Katie, and one for for Danny. Um, Katie, what should journalists be considering when covering protests, and how can they do better? So, number one. Can you tell the story without showing a face or without using a name? So just because our default has always been, we, we show fa faces of people who are in public, um, is, that, is that necessary? Can the story be told without showing that? Is there any damage to the public interest by shielding a name, um, by, using, uh, by using a pseudonym instead of an actual name? Um, if, if, if the story cannot be told as effectively or the public interest, and I mean the, I mean, all the public interest, not just the interest of your audience or readers or viewers. Um, but if we can, if you can still get the story across, do you really have to show that? And then I think another question is, what is the harm that people, that subjects are saying that will come to pass if you show them? So, so it, for, in, for instance, there was a, a controversial case at Harvard where um, the uh, the student newspaper um, received a, a ton of criticism um, for covering a, um, a dreamers protest and contacting immigration and custom enforcement for comment. They didn't, it was post, it was after the, after the protest, but something that a lot of people felt opened up undocumented students to scrutiny. So what harms are being expressed how, how can we um, think about our practices in relation to that? I mean, I think, the, I think the Harvard students did an admirable job of explaining their practices and talking about newsworthiness and talking about fairness and coverage. But let's not just rest on the laurels or lack thereof of our long, long time practices. Let's instead interrogate what, when and why those practices damage trust and if there's something else we could be doing differently. Doing it the way we've always done it just isn't going to work. I, I, I would like to add about the, um, the anonymity um, that da Danny was talking about, that you know th this country was born in anonymous pamphleteering, anonymous essay writers. Now, why, why were they granted anonymity back in the 1760s and 70s? It's because um, the writers were threatened with seditious libel prosecutions that would have put them in jail. And all through history, Journalists have made agreements with people that they've worked with, sources typically, um, that they would keep a name anonymous, give a, a pseudonym maybe, um, in exchange for information. So today, I mean, people leak information and the journalist grants anonymity to protect the source, right? So, so I think these, uh, the possibility of, of um, you know, granting anonymity to uh, someone who's protesting in the streets is, is a plausible thing to, to think about. Um, I think the one thing that gets in the way of that is uh, the fact that so many people are recording, right? So um, everybody in the protest has a, has a cell phone and they're recording, the police are recording, there's drones, there's cameras on buildings. Um, so there's just a lot of recording going on and there may be a few reporters there um, but there may be situations where you're interviewing someone um, and that's your interview and you grant them anonymity um, in, in some way in order to protect um, them from, from prosecution. I think that's, that's been done for a long time. Good, good points. Danny, let me ask you to sort of wrap up um, our, our formal Q&A before I turn to the audience questions by um, talking a little more about longer term what can be done to continue to build trust between journalists, protesters, and the communities they represent? Right. Um, well, I mean, I think it's easy to say, um, go to those communities and know who they are. <laughs> That's kind of the short-winded answer. 
But because um, I like to talk a lot, let me go a little bit long, a longer answer. Um, I, I think it goes beyond sort of community listening. Like you can't just listen to a couple of people and think you understand the community. I think people have to be in, in that community and immersed in that community and invested in that community. Um, the, um, the research that I've done is mostly in, in the black community, which um, uh, has has really been interesting in terms of figuring out what they want journalists to do. And so I can talk a little bit about that. But I think one of the key things about this conversation that, that, that we have to know is that communities, um, that the word community needs to be sort of problematized to some degree, right? Because not everybody lives in the same space and um, not everybody lives on the same street. Uh, and even though that, that, you know, we could look at redlining and know that, well, most people would be in a certain area and most people would live in a certain certain, you know, uh, geographic place. Um, communities are, are broad and expansive and um, figuring out where, where these different like um, manifestations of community are, are really important to breaking away from making community seem like a monolith, which I think is one of the biggest complaints sort of across the different communities that I've talked to um, is that they don't want to feel like a monolith. They want, they would not only want to have their voice represented, which they think is not there. But they also want to um, feel like the, the diversity of their culture, of their being is, is, um, is also represented. Uh, one of the ladies I talked to, I'll never forget, she said, heaven forbid <laughs> that there would be more than one Black person sourced in a weather story. And I thought, you know what, that is so, yes, preach, you know, <laughs> heaven forbid <laughs> that we would have opposing views about something like a weather story. And I think that that's what people want to see. They want to see that you know who they are, that they could be any source at any time. You don't go into their communities and just report the problems. You shouldn't anymore. You should not just report the conflict. Yes, there's a lot of juicy newsworthiness and all of that, right? It's beautiful and it makes front page headlines when there's a problem, but you know, it's also beautiful. It makes front page headlines, the, the um, enormous obstacles these communities have to triumph every single day to exist in our society that oppresses them. And so I think finding, you know, those triumph stories, finding um, what I have called in, in much of my research black joy, right? Finding the, the opposite of conflict and conflict controversy and finding finding a way to sort of exhibit their strength and resilience in our democracy that doesn't really grant them all of the freedoms. I think that's what's really essential um, in terms of, of, of building that trust back. I also think just as sort of a parting thought, it can't happen in a day. Right. And I know that a lot of a lot of times when I work with journalists or with students, they get really frustrated after like two weeks. They're like, ah, they didn't change. You know, they're <laughs> they're still mad at me. <laughs> Um, not one person can change the system and not one day or one week or one year can change that system either. Um, it, it's going to take lots of news organizations, lots of people involved, lots of people on board. It's going to take more than just calling for a racial reckoning. It's going to, to, to take engaging in it and shaking up all the things uh, to create a new system. And so um, so I just uh, for the journalists out there, um, hope that you find patience somewhere, maybe on a Peloton. I don't know. I'm going to try it out soon. but. <laughs> But you know, find patience uh, as you start to build these trust relationships back because trust is earned, as so many people say. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we've got 13 minutes left and we have um, 11 questions in the chat. There are some that are overlapping. So I'm gonna try to combine a few, but maybe we could call this the lightning round of questions. Um, and let me kind of go um, in, in the reverse order of, of our Q&A and talk about a couple of ethical questions first and maybe end with a couple of the legal questions. Um, Lauren Henning asks, I've experienced great distrust from some readers when I've done everything in my power to present everything I had in my work. How does a journalist mitigate the issues of ethics and credibility, especially in an age of high mistrust on all sides, you know, I read into that question. I'm doing everything. I'm doing all of these things you're telling me to do, and yet there's still mistrust. What What more can I do? Does anybody have any any uh, wisdom in a lightning round answer to that question? Yeah, Lauren. Lauren is one of my students, so I'm pretty sure she's gonna she's gonna be familiar with the concept that I'm about to say. But we have this very powerful and disconcerting thing called the hostile media phenomenon. So we can we can create um, a text and a news story that is 
as neutral as humanly possible. <laughs> so to the down to the word count attributed to a source on the left or a source on the right, and we can we can invert their comments and we can change them to different sides of an event, but you put that perfectly neutrally designed text in front of partisans on the left and the right, and they will both see it as hostile to their viewpoint. <laughs> um, so it is something, it's an effect of our own uh, desire to be right all the time, our motivated reasoning. Um, so, so to some extent, Lauren, you're just going to have to prepare yourself for some people to interpret your good work as hostile, um, as hostile to you. I, I, I often say from my time as a journalist, my skin had to grow so leathery, I'm coming back in my next life as a purse and a pair of shoes. Like I just, <laughs> uh, so, so in, in some ways you're just going to have to steal your spine, but you also should constantly be interrogating and investigating your own work and finding in ways in which people may be right that you are introducing biases um, into your coverage. None of us can be objective, it's just not possible as humans, but we can try to engage in objective methods. And, um, and one of the most important of those is constantly asking uh, where problems are slipping into our coverage, but keep doing good work and know that some of us appreciate it and we're not, we, we don't see hostility in your texts. There are a couple of questions uh, about um, partisanship. And so let me combine maybe two of them. One from uh, Ken Wang, who says he's a sophomore studying political science and opinion editor at the Badger Herald at uh, University of Wisconsin. And another question by Anita Varma, who Katie mentioned her research. Oh, she's uh, here. <laughs> about, um, very excellent research about um, journalists and uh, having empathy and solidarity with the communities they cover and, and the le or the ethical issues that come up. So the question, maybe I'm going to botch both of them by trying to, to merge them together, but the question is how best do you focus on facts without appearing partisan and how do you deal with the partisan lens that, that many people view everything in? And as Ken says, for example, liberal media calling protesters protesters and conservative media calling protesters mobs. And Anita, um, let me read part of Anita's question. Um, a major tension that newsroom leaders often raise is that their audiences include Trump supporters and sympathizers. And journalists are leading the newsroom reckoning right now argue that Trump supporters are not who journalism is meant to serve. Does journalism have a responsibility to serve the entire political spectrum when part of the political spectrum may be fine and even favor of the status quo, where should they draw the line? Maybe not fair to ask you to answer that in a lightning round answer, <laughs> um, but uh, any quick thoughts on the partisan nature of uh, journalistic audiences and the, the ethics that journalists should, should bring to, to that? My short answer would be, I think it depends on who you think delivers facts, right? Who makes the facts? How are the facts made? And how do you trust them? And I think that that will create partisan issues all the way around, right? When you decide that a police report doesn't include all of the data that was supposed to be there, right? And all of a sudden you just have to start questioning police as an official source, which I encourage you to do. Um, same thing with, with politicians. Is what they say actually true? Is, what, is how they're engaging in, in behavior actually true? I think we came to like a, a sort of agreement that we don't have to talk Talk about um, uh, you know that global warming is a hoax. <laughs> I think we we agreed that no, we don't have to report that side anymore. And I think that we have to agree about that on a lot of different issues in our current co political climate. I think I think the job of journalists is to is to find out what the truth is. You know, and I think one of the things we saw towards uh, at least the last month or so of the, um, the you know in January maybe December. Um, was you know a lot of news organizations starting to actually say that people were lying and putting that in stories? I for me myself, I mean, I always see journalism as serving the public interest. I don't understand how you can serve the public interest when um, part of that public would be excluded. So if you know if if some within your readership or within your community are seeking to actively exclude others within your community, I don't understand how um, elevating that serves anyone's interest or serves our general interest, I should say. 
Um, let me let me move to a couple of questions about uh, some legal questions about journalists' rights and covering protests. There are a couple of questions about um, the fact that journalists were broadcasting live from inside the Capitol during the insurrection. And so if part of our thinking and, and advice is journalists do not have any extra legal rights beyond the public, and certainly that uh, invasion of the Capitol was illegal, um, uh, what should journalists have done in covering those events on the ground? Should, um, I don't know if I can find it quickly, but was it okay for a journalist to go into the Capitol given the newsworthiness and importance of covering what was happening or should a journalist remain outside and avoid trespassing but miss the story? I, mean, I think I know what my answer would be, but uh, I am just the moderator <laughs> and I would like to hear what uh, our panelists say. Well, well me, I, go, go ahead, oh, Katie. Sorry. I, sometimes things are legal and ethical. Um, sometimes they are legal and unethical, and sometimes they are illegal and ethical. And I would say following protesters in violating the um, no trespass order is justifiable. It is a moment in history that needed to be recorded. Um, it was an, an overt attempt to subvert democracy. Um, we all benefited from seeing that, it, it, that coverage that we would not, again, it was a particular kind of witnessing um, and, and we needed that. And so in this case, and while they arguably could have been arrested, um, those journalists did us a service in, in, in going into the Capitol on that day. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think there are, there are actually a number of cases that have been decided over the years in which journalists tried to get a story like that. They, they went over police lines to record or to take notes or whatever, and they got arrested. And um, they really didn't have any good defense because they shouldn't have been there and the protesters shouldn't have been there. That said, I agree with Katie that you gotta kind of follow a story that's as profound as this one. It is history. And uh, you, you, sometimes you just have to take risks. Well, with, with that, I want to um, bring us uh, to, to a conclusion. I think this was a really great discussion about a lot of uh, complex interrelated issues that we are going to be facing uh, well into the future. So um, Danielle Kilgore, Katie Culver, and Stephen Solomon, I wanna thank you uh, very much. And we will continue these conversations online and in many other formats. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. And thanks everyone for attending. Yeah.